can I also say to all members that we're very late in starting this debate, um, and unless we are very, very disciplined, I don't think we'll be finished this evening until 6.15. The next item of business is a debate on COVID-19 next steps for the economy, and I call on Fiona Hislop, Cabinet Secretary, for no more than 12 minutes. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, last Tuesday I made a statement to Parliament about our approach to the restart and recovery of the economy and our route map out of lockdown. From the questions that followed that statement, it was clear that while it was right to set out the forward-looking plan for recovery, we are still dealing with significant economic impacts from the initial and, as we've heard, continuing COVID crisis. And this impact will not just be on our economy, but on our communities and especially on our society's most vulnerable people. It will be essential that we work together across this chamber to develop responses that mitigate those impacts and to begin to build the foundations for a better future. The foundations for a genuine well-being economy which reflects the principles of our national performance framework. The best way to build our recovery will be by working collaboratively across parties with industry, unions and other partners to build trust and confidence, building on the constructive and fruitful engagement we have seen to date, but with a clear vision of what we want to achieve. The scale of the challenges ahead are significant. We could be looking at a 33% fall in GDP during the current period of physical distancing and a sharp rise in the number of claimants for job seekers allowance and universal credit in March and April has taken the number of claims to 186,000, around 6.6% of the workforce. We expect that to increase and could reach 10%. Some sectors are more at risk, including manufacturing, construction, retail and wholesale tourism, accommodation and food services, and arts, entertainment and recreation. Impacts will also differ regionally and exposure to the impacts of COVID-19 will vary according to the composition of industrial workforce and population structures. Many of the most exposed sectors are more likely to be in rural areas. Now, I understand the challenges for business whose international markets have been lost or disrupted, who must now reconnect uh, with their supply chains and create new markets. Indeed. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. She, she rightly is addressing the various issues affecting different sectors, but with the SCVO uh, highlighting a report today that 50% of charities believe they will run out of money in the next six months, I think it highlights the fact that this is a, a, an issue that will affect the charitable sector as well as the private sector. I wonder if you would agree with that point. Fiona Hislop. I'm aware of the, the, the charitable sector and indeed social enterprise sector and it was one of the reasons in, uh, in terms of our response that we expanded the, the grants uh, system to enable uh, charities to have access uh, but that's about dealing with the crisis but we need those areas and those uh, parts of the economy to help uh, develop uh, and I think charities have a role in terms of our societal response. In terms of business, uh, international markets have been lost or disrupted. They need to reconnect with their supply chains and create new markets. And all of this is an environment where consumer sentiment in the UK has fallen to its lowest levels since the financial crisis, with personal finances deteriorating sharply from March. Business optimism uh, has also fallen sharply and significantly uncertainty surrounding the pandemic um, has uh, wider implications as we, we know. We still have the impending impact of Brexit to contend with and the real risk of a no deal outcome will compound and exacerbate the crisis. So it's important to set out this context to be realistic about the scale of the challenge ahead. The economic situation we're facing is unprecedented and it will require an unprecedented response. When the crisis hit, we moved quickly to support businesses to deal with cash flow challenges through our £2.3 billion business support package. But we are aware that, they, that many have also had to take on debt to survive. Where we can do more, we will. Where the current funds are not oversubscribed, we are committed to taking any available funding and targeting it back into the economy where it is needed most. The latest figures from last week show that £790 million has been awarded to over 69,000 ratepayers through the Two Business Grant Scheme. Last week, I announced that we would extend the Small Business Grant to applications from small businesses that occupy shared office spaces, business incubators and shared industrial units 
and lease the space where the landlord is the registered uh, ratepayer. We will also extend the upper threshold for retail hospitality or leisure properties with individual rateable values of up to £18,000 each. And from 8th of June, the cumulative threshold currently at 51000 will be increased to a cumulative value of 500000 This almost tenfold increase will benefit over 2,500 premises. On April the 30th, we launched a £100 million package across three business support funds, offering targeted support to the creative tourism and hospitality sector, SMEs vital to the local economies and the newly self-employed. One month on, we have awarded over £104 million of grants to those uh, businesses and enterprises. We have supported around 2,500 businesses and 4,160 self-employed people, topping up these funding streams given the volume of applications received. And these additional funds announced will enable us to reach more businesses in need. And today I can announce that £3 million of the newly self-employed hardship fund allocation will be repurposed to support bed and breakfast who are ineligible for other support due to not having a business bank account. We expect applications to open for this fund administered by local authorities on the 15th of June. In the short to medium term, businesses will need further resources to aid recovery as they rebuild their working capital. In the longer term, the unprecedented level of borrowing we are seeing may affect resources available to invest in growth and innovation to improve productivity. And we know that the economy will not rebound to 100% immediately. A gradual return and reduced demand will impact businesses and employment beyond the end of the current support schemes. And our support for businesses must go beyond the financial. We will listen to business and support them to learn lessons from other countries, support them to innovate and institute new practices and processes. Our enterprise agencies have been working tirelessly to support their local economies with non-financial support and advice. Scottish for Enterprise has been safeguarding jobs and supply chains through its work with company administrators and using its networks to identify and secure buyers. Highlands and Islands Enterprise has redesigned many of its services to be de delivered digitally. The South of Scotland Enterprise Partnership has continued to build its capacity, engaging with stakeholders since its launch in April to provide targeted support for businesses. Additionally, access to affordable upskilling opportunities was identified as an early priority and Skills Development Scotland launched free online learning opportunities in April with over 80,000 visits to those resources in a month. At the end of this month, the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board subgroup on unemployment will report its initial findings and recommendations for action to Scottish ministers. The group is working at pace to agree a short list of practical actions government can take quickly to mitigate the rising levels of unemployment with particular focus on young people. During times of recession, it can be a challenge to continue to invest in the skills base. But now more than ever, there needs to be support to ensure that we can draw on all our talent in the recovery phase. We cannot lose our focus on promoting fair work and ensuring those who have traditionally faced greater barriers in entering the labour market are not left behind. We must continue to support young people, disabled people, those from ethnic minority backgrounds, care experienced young people and people with convictions. We know the impacts of this crisis will not fall evenly. The majority of our key workers are women, but they are more likely to be lower paid and in precarious or temporary employment. Our recovery must ensure that we are closing the gender pay gap and the disability employment gap. Lockdown has demonstrated that there is a significant proportion of work that can be done at home, keeping many parts of the economy and society moving during lock lockdown whilst keeping people out of harm's way. We know that it can work and it can be improved by investing in new technology and approaches that can be a catalyst for more flexible working, reducing travel and commuting and, more, and uh, promoting more balanced lifestyles. These are all critical aspects of an inclusive well-being economy. And if we are to change the way we think about work, models such as community wealth building, which require government at all levels, businesses and communities to work together to invest in and grow local and regional economies from the asset base they possess, must be central to our recovery. Interest in the community wealth building model is growing rapidly across Scotland. The Scottish Government has committed to £3 million of investment as part of the Ayrshire Growth Deal to accelerate progress on this. This is a, an international crisis which needs a national recovery, but our response must be based on local and regional solutions. 
In recent years, our focus on inclusive growth has seen us work with local authorities to better understand the drivers of poverty, inequality, and how that links to economic sustainability and the ability to create better jobs with their roots in local communities. Over the last few weeks, we have had emptier roads and we've embraced our relationship with nature through our daily exercise. We must build on this, ensuring our economic recovery is a green recovery. We do have an ambitious climate change target of ending Scotland's contribution to climate change by 2045. But, you, but we also have a strong track record in supporting decarbonisation projects in low carbon heat. Hydrogen, carbon capture utilisation and storage and on and offshore wind and the electrification of transport must surely be part of that restart and recovery. Our end goal has not changed, but as a result of this crisis, the path we may take may have to. It may be more challenging, but we should look upon the process of restarting the economy as an opportunity to fully embed the principles that we have all signed up to uh, of a green economy for Scotland. So, presiding officer, to conclude, I absolutely understand and sympathise with the sacrifices being made by businesses and individuals and the hardship this is causing. I think that all sides of the chamber recognise that the restrictions in place are vital to suppressing the virus. The transition out of lockdown must not risk undoing what we have achieved so far, but we must also not lose the opportunity to learn from this. Indeed, we must recognise that some measures will and should remain part of daily life for the foreseeable future. Presiding officer, as I said earlier, this is an unprecedented situation for our economy. Recovery will require everybody in this parliament to work together to be part of the solution. This parliament has an opportunity and a duty to lead and to demonstrate that we can work together to shape a new economic future, one with a better balance of work and well-being. We must mobilise all the significant talent, experience and thinking that exists throughout Scotland and beyond to help Scotland's cause. I want Parliament to be a key part of that, starting with this debate, to begin to set out some of the ideas and thinking that will drive our recovery over the coming weeks and months. And I look forward to hearing members' contributions. I call on Morris Bolton for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy presiding officer. Coronavirus is the biggest economic challenge we have faced, perhaps that which we have ever faced. Our plan must revolve around inclusive growth and ensuring that no person is left behind. Workers must be put to the fore in all our considerations. The public sector, businesses and the third sector all have a role to play in securing future prosperity for Scotland. The task at hand is to keep businesses afloat and therefore protect and safeguard jobs. Only a third of Scottish businesses are currently trading, with over half having had to close. Of those closed, a third fear they may never reopen. Businesses of all sizes and across all sectors have been affected with thousands of jobs at risk. The UK government quickly launched a massive rescue effort to save Scotland's economy from collapsing. They have already pumped £3.5 billion into Scotland to help fight coronavirus. The figure is even higher when we add in the job retention scheme that has saved over 300,000 Scottish jobs. That comes on top of all the other action the UK government is taking, such as paying the wages of the self-employed, ensuring sick pay from day one and letting companies claim it back, mortgage holidays, helping people struggling to pay their energy bills and offering interest-free loans to small and medium companies. The total of these measures equate to a £10 billion investment into the Scottish economy. The effectiveness of these measures can be seen in new research from the Institute for Government, which shows the UK has been more successful at saving jobs than the USA, Canada or Ireland. Yet despite both the Finance Secretary and the Economy Secretary praising the UK Government's approach, they have used a less generous system for Scotland. English businesses receive £25,000 per additional property, whilst the SNP gives Scottish businesses just £18,500. Happy to. 
Kate Forbes. Does the member think it's uh, less generous to put in place a pivotal resilience fund, a hardship fund, and ensure that more small businesses get the £10,000 grant? Maurice Golden. Well, I would urge the Finance Secretary in our considerations to look at all those businesses that are not receiving grants and to look at any savings from the Scottish budget in order to, to pay for those. Uh, the, the Scottish Conservatives have managed to secure a partial U-turn to include multiple properties where the SNP had initially refused to include them, but over 16,000 firms are still waiting to get their money. The outcome is that the SNP are being taken to court by Scottish businesses for what they regard as a failure to support adequately. This approach has put jobs at risk. Moreover, the SNP have steadfastly refused to utilise savings from the Scottish budget to support Scotland at this time and in fact made decisions which will increase costs which do not aid our recovery. To make matters worse, Scotland was already in a poor state to deal with this crisis after years of economic mismanagement. Over half Scotland's borrowing capacity has already been spent and the SNP had to put Scotland in last place for both uh, business and job growth. Our economic priority must be to ensure a safe and lasting recovery. Fiona Hislop. I remember way of, uh, aware of the Ernst Young report that was published uh, just in the last few days that showed that Scotland again had outperformed every part of the UK apart from London in terms of inward investment and moreover that the impact on jobs was extensive indeed. Uh, and in terms of uh, this debate, uh, can you please uh, raise the game? Let's try and hear about the ideas and the perspectives and the vision and, the, and all, those, all those things that I'm inviting him to contribute as part of that restarting the economy of Scotland. Morris Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I'll come on to ideas shortly, but the fact is that the SNP, and I appreciate that the Cabinet Secretary wasn't in, in post at this stage, but her previous incumbent left her with a major problem to address the deficiencies in the Scottish economy due to a, a failing growth rate and problems retaining jobs. Therefore, in addition, businesses need uh, more support for tra can, trace and track measures to, that have forced them to reclose. The Federation of Small Businesses has already called for a new financial assistance package for such situations. We must also look at modifying our high streets, I said they'd come to ideas, to accommodate social distancing. The Scottish Conservatives want fair funding for councils, communities and businesses and for prompt action, such as the FSB's suggestion of local places task forces to adapt town centres and coordinate queues. We also need uh, the SNP to better coordinate with the rest of the UK to avoid damage to Scottish businesses and jobs. For example, Scottish manufacturers have proven they can work safely producing NHS orders, but the SNP refused to let them reopen, handing English firms a free run at contracts. Or the construction industry, safely working again in England, but the SNP will not name a restart date for Scotland. Meanwhile, desperate homeowners are losing thousands of pounds. Or retail, where, as David Lonsdale of the Scottish Retail Consortium noted, Scottish firms operate across the UK and vice versa. Diverging timescales and regulations add confusion to an industry already losing £130 million per week in non-food sales. As a matter of urgency, we must hear why Scottish businesses and when they can reopen. If diversion from the rest of the country, explain why. Beyond those immediate concerns, we must look to the long term. Oil and gas, for example, coronavirus and low oil prices are putting highly skilled jobs at risk. Once they go, it's hard to get them back. The First Minister promised support weeks ago, but we have heard nothing since. We need that detail if we're to secure future energy and decommissioning projects, as well as make a fair transition to a more green economy. Small businesses need help too, such as expanding online services. The past weeks have seen online services surge, and that will only grow. Providing e-commerce support 
now gives those businesses the best chance to take advantage of growth. Procurement reform is a must too. Micro businesses win just 7% of public contracts despite making up 93% of small businesses. And over 20,000 local firms have been dropped to suppliers by councils since 2008. Even a modest increase in public contract spending for small local firms could have a big impact on businesses and local communities. Training and upskilling are important too, especially for our young people. The Economy Committee heard how the 16 to 24 age group will be hardest hit by job losses. The Scottish Conservatives already want to see in school or, or, or training until at least 18, along with better access to apprenticeships and college places. The task ahead is daunting, but we have seen what can be accomplished when differences are put aside. Scotland benefits enormous, enormously when both the UK and Scottish governments work together for a common purpose. That must be the approach we have to rebuilding our economy. For the sake of every Scottish worker, I hope the Scottish Government agrees. I call Richard Leonard, please, for no more than seven minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In, in every community, in every street, in almost every home across Scotland, people are facing some difficult questions. Living from day to day, many losing sleep at night, anxious, not knowing when they can return to work, not knowing if they can return to work, not knowing if there is a job or a business there for them at all. These are the difficult questions. These are the serious pressures which people are struggling with. And they are looking to us, looking to this parliament to help them find the answers, which is why I want to be crystal clear at the start of this debate that this goes beyond party politics, that we will work with the government to get every one of Scotland's people through this crisis and to make sure that they do not pay the price for an economic crisis which they did not create. But the evidence is all around us that just as we were unprepared for this public health crisis, so we are unprepared for this crisis in our economy too. The underlying weaknesses of the Scottish economy have not been tackled. All those years when the Scottish Government could have been taking action to diversify and strengthen the Scottish economy, it has failed to do so. Which is why, despite the measures introduced by both governments to help businesses keep afloat, many are already going under. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure that the Scottish Government even knows how many businesses in Scotland are under stress, or even knows how many will go bust when state aid stops. I spoke to the Federation of Small Businesses just last week, who told me that a third of their members whose businesses are closed said they did not think that they would reopen across all sectors of the Scottish economy, in all parts of Scotland, a third. So for them, there will be no going back. For them, this is not an opportunity. It is a very real threat. And everything we already know points to a slow and painful recovery. Fewer businesses taking on new workers, consumers unsure about spending, culture and tourism still restricted for months ahead, entire industries at breaking point. So we are facing a massive collapse in our service sector, uncertain of future demand and so reluctant to invest. And we know that our manufacturing base, which has been allowed to decline over the last decade, is also in deep trouble. Which is why Scotland needs a national plan to deliver green jobs to ensure we meet climate change targets instead of too much of that work going abroad. It's why Scotland needs both governments to work together to deliver the scale of the investment that is needed. And it is why we must come together and defeat the arguments for austerity, because there can be no going back, no going back to austerity. Which is why we ask this afternoon the Scottish Government to support the STUC's call for a two-year emergency stimulus of £13 billion of investment in an economic recovery plan 
a jobs plan. And let me say this, this new approach must target our young people. They must be on our route map. They must be part of our next steps because tackling unemployment and tackling youth unemployment must be our number one economic priority, but it must be our social priority and our moral priority too. We want the talents of our young people to flourish, not least when there is so much unmet urgent community need, when there is so much useful work to be done. We have called before, and I call on the government again today to work with us, with employers, with trade unions, with local government, to introduce a job guarantee scheme as part of a plan for jobs and an industrial strategy. That route map, those next steps, must include democracy in our economy. We know that community wealth building by local government could be a real engine for sustainable economic development. We know that cooperative ownership, employee ownership, has a part to play. And we also know that the pandemic has shown the importance of strong trade unions. It has shown that people want to have a better balance between work and life. And it has also shown that when they are at work, people want to take more decisions for themselves. They want more control over their lives and their work. So merely tinkering with these problems will not do. We must harness the hard work, the creativity, the resolve and dedication, the selflessness of the people to build a better economy, a good economy. So that if we want full employment, decent pay, training for all, security of employment, decent homes, dignity in retirement, the government and this parliament will have to take the lead. Presiding officer, I began by talking about the need for unity and the Scottish Labour Party will unite with other parties in this parliament and with the government. As long as we are traveling in the right direction, as long as the boldness in words by government is matched by boldness in deeds by government. And in so doing, in that unified approach, we will appeal to all people of goodwill to work together, not to divide, but to unite, to join together in common endeavor, to build a better future, a better future than the past that we left behind 10 weeks ago. Andy Whiteman, please, for up to six minutes. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, as been noted by many people, of course, this is a, an economic crisis as well as a uh, health crisis. But uh, unlike 2008 and the last financial crisis we faced, um, this one has led to a prolonged period uh, of closure uh, of many businesses and recoveries dependent on the speed and efficacy of a vaccine that may never uh, arrive. So in the words of the Cabinet Secretary from last week's uh, debate, a time indeed for a revolution in economic thinking. Presiding officer, we are concerned with the fate of Scotland's uh, businesses, obviously, and they'll remain a, an important focus uh, in the months ahead. But the economy is not solely about the interests of businesses. It's about workers, it's about infrastructure, about care, about housing uh, and the environment. And traditionally in, in developed economies, particularly since the onset uh, of neoliberalism, economic success, success by the measure of GDP has come at the cost of growing inequality, continuing poverty and a continued assault on the natural world. Now, green economics has always concerned itself with reversing this trend and ensuring that economies are built around people and not profit. Indeed, it's evident that one significant failure in Western capitalism has been the focus on shareholder value and profit that's driven short-term thinking and left the wider community paying the costs uh, of job insecurity, uh, not, to, not to mention significant financial risks. And that's why we welcome uh, uh, an economic recovery plan to be built around well-being, one that focuses on ensuring an end to inequality and insecurity. But that means, in terms of an economic debate, that does mean security of housing. It means affordable transport, reliable infrastructure, energy and food security, and a clean and sustainable uh, environment. And the long-term health of any economy, including uh, the health of private businesses, cannot be achieved without addressing those fundamentals. Yet yeah, a slew of reports, some of which have been mentioned already over recent weeks, has found that the impacts of the COVID crisis have fallen disproportionately on women, on younger people, and on the minority ethnic population. Now, this sadly should not be surprising. These groups, particularly younger people, have suffered flat wages, job insecurity, and high housing costs since the financial crash over 10 years ago. 
For example, a third of 18 to 24 year olds have lost their jobs or been furloughed, uh, and a third of lower paid employees have lost jobs or been furloughed compared to only one in 10 of top uh, earners. And an important report from the, from the uh, IPPR uh, called Who Wins and Who Pays Rent to Your Power and the COVID Crisis, published a couple of weeks ago, lays bare the fact that the crisis has exacerbated inequalities between the working poor who are reliant on wages, uh, who, who also have high fixed costs of rent, food and energy. Uh, and measures to propose to tackle this include higher taxes on wealth, land ownership and excess profits, rent freezes and controls and writing off debt. The report also highlights the important point that supporting people's income is only one side of the coin. Reducing their costs is just as important. On rents and energy in particular, which is why it was so disappointing that Parliament voted against measures to increase tenant security two weeks ago. Now, a week ago, the Cabinet Secretary said that we need a, revolution, a revolution in economic thinking that stimulates and values cooperative sharing of risk and reward. Now, that is indeed a bold a vision. I hope it's realised, but the tide remains very much in the opposite direction. Sharing of risk and reward cannot be achieved without fundamental reform of company law and the duties of, and roles of directors and shareholders. The Cabinet Secretary also went on to say that this revolution has to involve replacing old thinking over, of, of battling over wealth distribution that is never properly delivered with collective endeavour. However, wealth inequality has grown over the past 10 years. The battle has barely commenced and should certainly not be uh, abandoned. And moreover, we still have the scandalous situation where the lowest 20% of earners continue to pay more as a, in tax as a percentage of their income than the top 20%. Uh, Our presiding officer, this parliament faces significant challenges in recovering from this crisis. It can do more on wealth taxes as local taxes on property property and land, it can do more on giving more power to local communities and local councils, it can do more on tackling health inequalities, pollution, access to affordable transport and of course to reducing the costs of housing through rent reductions, freezes and tax reform. But I don't believe this parliament has the requisite powers in relation to fiscal policy, employment, uh, business policies uh, and immigration and regardless of our position on the constitutional question. We need to pay attention to this because cooperation with the UK government has evidently been strong, but Greens do not believe that this will continue given the very different political and economic priorities of Edinburgh and London. And one example of this is the extent to which current expenditure is being met through borrowing and not just borrowing from the private sector. The Bank of England is uh, engaged in a process of, of injecting 200 billion pounds into the economy through the purchase of gilts. Now, the finance to fund this has been created out of thin air. Uh, quantitative easing is the polite term. But given this is money borrowed by the UK government from a central bank that it owns, this money need never be paid back. Indeed, the initial loans that created the Bank of England in 1694, 1694 have never been paid uh, off. Now, this powerful tool of a central bank is not available to Scotland. And it's reasonable, I think, therefore, to ask that a population share of this quantitative easing is made available to the Scottish administration to tackle economic uh, recovery. Presenting officer, in conclusion, the next month's will, as others have said, test the devolution settlement like nothing since 1999. Uh, it will challenge us all. Uh, Greens will redouble our own efforts to ensure a safe and green recovery. Thank you, presenting officer. <coughs> Willie Rennie, please, for up to six minutes. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Liberal Democrats have sought throughout this pandemic to be constructive. We've offered solutions rather than hunt to apportion blame. Of course, there are mistakes, big mistakes, and there will be time to look back at that. But in the middle of a global pandemic, people expect us to put our shoulder to the wheel right now. I have to say I've been very impressed by the dedication from the workers and councils, the enterprise agencies, HMRC, DWP, government agencies, as well as central government. They have engineered and executed new financial support schemes in weeks for what in the past would have taken years to construct. And I think they deserve all of our appreciation. We have supported the Scottish Government's more cautious approach to the restrictions, although we have questioned the clarity of the message with differences between the law, the guidance and the rhetoric on non-essential businesses causing unnecessary tension in the workplace. But what does that mean for now? Caroline Fairbairn from the Confederation of British Industry said some weeks ago that the economy cannot afford a damaging second peak. 
and customers will not return unless they have the confidence to do so. That is why businesses need good guidance to keep their workers and their customers safe. So as the virus fades, confidence can grow and so can the economy. The lockdown has only been possible with the financial support of our government and it can only be extended if the support is extended too, which is why the Chancellor is right to extend and taper the furlough and self-employment schemes. And if there is a second wave of the virus, the Chancellor needs to stand ready with a second phase of the financial support as well. But the gaps in the schemes now are leaving many people in great difficulty. That includes the self-employed, paid by dividends, freelancers, those not eligible for universal credit, premises above 51,000, the self-employed earning just above that 50,000 pound limit. And we need to consider extending support for students and tourism businesses who will lose out on all of their peak season income if the lockdown continues. Ministers have responded positively to our suggestions on bank accounts, on fishermen, on renters, on self-catering, and on the self-employed before. And I hope they do so again when I meet the ministers on Thursday. I also want to lobby them on the UK, or lobby UK ministers to implement a universal basic income. It, needed, it is needed now to make sure that no one is left behind right now. I have been disappointed that ministers have not already had direct discussions with the Chancellor about such a scheme for now. This is not some lofty dream for a distant future, but a measure that is urgent to help people today. Spain is doing it. Even Donald Trump has sent everyone a $1,200 cheque. Let's get on with this right now. In defence of Donald Trump, I, I let Murdo Fraser in. Sorry, I'm just getting back in the saddle. Murdo Fraser, please. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Welcome back as well. Um, Mr. Rennie mentioned Spain. Did you realise that the scheme being implemented in Spain is more akin to universal credit than it is to what most people would recognise as a universal basic income? Will they ready? What the principle is, is that there's a guaranteed threshold below which nobody should fall. And that, that universalism is what is required when we have schemes that have so many gaps within them. And it's through no fault of either government that that has happened because they've had to do it in a hurry. But there has to be an acceptance that there are many gaps and those gaps need to be filled. And that is something that I hope Murdo Fraser would perhaps lend his support to try and achieve because it's something that I believe is essential. And if I can welcome the Deputy Presiding Officer back to our seat from our, our long period in exile in the borders. Um, it's good to see her back today. Um, finally, I want to consider what is next. It took the country decades to pay off the debt from the Second World War. Clearing our virus debt too soon would not only be an intolerable burden on people today, but would also crush any fledgling economic recover, recovery and further deprive young people of the opportunities in life that they deserve. We have a responsibility to future generations to get this right. We would never be forgiven if we were to leave them with a massive debt without taking the opportunity to reshape our economy and society into a more sustainable, fair and just model. So what does that mean? I think it means investing in people and their skills and their talents, their ingenuity and their dedication to this country. The dedication that we have seen all too evident over the last few weeks. Changing the way that we work, cutting unnecessary travel, using the technologies that we have become accustomed to. We need to embed flexible working so we can maintain the better quality of life and that work-life balance. We must accelerate the conversion of electricity and heat to decentralised and sustainable sources so we can continue to benefit from the reduced pollution that we have experienced recently. Fairness and equity for incomes. The very people who have been out there on the front line during this pandemic are often the people who are paid the least. There's care workers, the refuse collectors, the posties, the delivery drivers, and also the food processing facilities. That's got to change. 
We must invest in people to catch up. People will need to be retrained for the new jobs for the new jobs and we need the educational catch-up funds as well to make this difference. Out of this darkness, we need to do something new, something better, something that we can achieve for this country to create that sustainable future that we can all be proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rennie. Open debate, speeches of uh, six minutes, please. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Murdo Fraser. Mr Gibson. <laughs> Welcome back, presiding officer. The pandemic has forced upon us an immediate goal, saving lives which overshadows all else. As the virus retreats, our economic focus must grow. Right now, entire sectors of the economy are paralysed. Our response must be determined and flexible. Alan's O'Crani Resort is run by an employee ownership trust on behalf of its 171 employees. All but six are currently furloughed. On an island of 4,600 inhabitants, O'Crani's staff represent a huge chunk of the island's workforce. They turned a 16-bedroom guesthouse into a world-class resort. It is a major provider of indoor leisure facilities to island residents and visitors, with 90% occupancy and an annual turnover of 8.5 million in normal times. Recovery from COVID-19 could be swift. However, last week the Transport Secretary suggested that upon lifting lockdown restrictions, ferry capacity could be limited to a shockingly low 17 or 18%. Already, island hotels are at a competitive disadvantage, as visitors have to pay ferry fares to get there. It's worth it for what's on offer. However, going forward, how can island businesses survive if visitors cannot even get there? If unable to reopen soon, Nochrani will be forced to make the majority of staff redundant from the end of July unless it receives assistance. Direct Scottish Government support is essential to ensure survival. Unless progress is made by mid-June, there will be no alternative to starting the redundancy process, payroll national insurance costs in August and furlough top-up costs from September, plus accrued holidays will lead to administration. Cabinet Secretary, I warmly welcome your announcement of the £51,000 rateable value limit for grants, which risks the future of major hospitality businesses, has been lifted to half a million pounds. And this will help Ochrani and many of the 2,380 businesses in Scotland which employ 250 or more people. Clearly, this is a listening government which will, I know, do more. We must back innovative start-ups and our productive export-led sectors such as aerospace, data, food and drink, access growing global markets for sustainable goods and services. But although, but to, to go, but although funds are not unlimited, supermarkets which have paid out colossal sums in dividends while seeking profits soar are being provided with millions of pounds in rates relief. Surely it would be better to redirect uh, some relief into a struggling hotel and hospitality sectors which face a bleak future without ongoing assistance, leading to rising unemployment, particularly in rural and island Scotland and amongst young workers. We know the UK has already reneged on £60 million pounds of consequences allocated for business support. Any money Scottish ministers allocated but not yet claimed for anticipated grant applications redirected where they're most desperately needed will save businesses and jobs. And, as other speakers have already mentioned, we must lead the development of clean energy and new technologies, such as hydrogen and increased job-creating home insulation measures, which will be key to future success. Our economic restart must be safe, and as we emerge slowly from lockdown, we begin to see some light ahead of us, a return to normality. At least, that's what I hope for. Not a society where social distancing becomes an accepted part of daily life, no. The pre-COVID world we lived in less than three short months ago. A world of everyday human social interaction, of theatre, cinema, football, pubs, restaurants and bunching up at parties or on trains. Not the wearing of bandanas like a latter-day Jesse James or masks like a character from a dystopian sci-fi film while sitting on a bus. One hopes such measures will be very temporary. The economic response will be defined by four phases as pointed out by the Cabinet Secretary of Economy last week. Response, reset, restart and recovery. I would mingle in reality, resources and redirection. We are a sub-state legislature with minimal room for economic manoeuvre and resources are a major issue. The impact on our care sector and NHS and the need to provide additional funds amidst rising debt, unemployment and a resultant decline in our tax base must be faced. We can't levy duty on alcohol, tobacco or fuel. Corporation tax, VAT, national insurance and pension contributions are not under our control. Lockdown in reality, will end when UK furlough pension and national insurance payments end. Borrowing powers are limited, so we must focus on the achievable. The crisis will see UK national debt soar beyond £2 trillion, pushing it above 100% of income for the first time since World War II, described by the Institute of Economic Affairs as staggering. And three quarters of businesses report damage to their supply chain. We must work with them to fix what is broken. We cannot return to austerity. 
Scottish ministers have already acted positively to support the productive economy of the future, putting innovation and technology at the heart of our new futures industrial plan. For example, with an additional £20 million for the National Manufacturing Institute Scotland, which aims to make us a world leader in advanced manufacturing, and £15.8 million of investment via the Advanced Manufacturing Challenge Fund to help small and medium-sized enterprises develop their manufacturing capabilities. The oddly named Internet of Things is a game changer already embraced by the Scottish Government. It will allow companies to create new products and services or implement cost and time-saving efficiencies. The IoT's environmental health and social care applications will also impact positively on society. Presiding officer, we need much more creative thinking if we are to haul ourselves from this post-pandemic recession and remain internationally competitive. We must grow both our indigenous companies and attract inward investment. It's heartening that in Ernest & Young Scotland attractive in the survey of international investment showed only last week that in 2019 Scotland was the top destination outside London among the UK's 12 nations and regions for foreign direct investment for the seventh consecutive year. Good news that somewhat derailed Maurice Golden's Tory narrative. Of course, Brexit and the damage it will cause looms, and I urge the UK government to seek a two-year extension of the transition period this month before it's too late and our economic recovery from the pandemic is derailed. Only today can Federation of British Industry Director Carolyn Fairbairn said, and I quote, for businesses, jobs and economic confidence in this most challenging years, this would be a shocking outcome. Scotland deserves a better future. Thank you very much, Mr Gibson. I call Murdo Fraser to follow by Maureen Watt. Mr Fraser, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'd just like to start by referencing some comments I, I made in a debate here just three weeks ago when we discussed the easing of lockdown restrictions. And at that time, I made the point that lockdown was not, as is sometimes portrayed, a trade-off between lives and jobs. We now know that uh, 1,200 people in Scotland have died, uh, over and above normally expected numbers from non-COVID-19 related illnesses. And many more will die in the future as a result of lockdown. But we also know that lockdown is having a hugely detrimental economic impact, one we'll have to live with for many years to come. We are likely to see unemployment soar, and a whole raft of businesses failing. And in the long run, this will mean fewer job opportunities, a poorer country, and less tax revenue to spend on all the public services that are important to us. So getting the economy back working as quickly as possible is absolutely essential to our future well-being as a country. Now, I have a particular interest in the future of Scottish tourism, vital as it is to communities throughout Mid-Scotland and Fife, and I'd like to spend the rest of my time talking a bit about uh, what can be done to help the tourist industry. In rural Fife and Stirlingshire and Perthshire, tourism is the lifeblood of local communities. And normally at this time of year, we'd be seeing local hotels, B&Bs, lodges and campsites filling up with visitors from the rest of the UK and all over the world. The enormous knock-on impact of not having that essential source of income is already being felt. And the latest business support schemes using Treasury money, either directly or channeled through the Scottish Government, have been absolutely essential in keeping Scottish businesses afloat. However, there are still a range of issues that need to be addressed. Uh, firstly, and this is an issue I have raised before, there is a real question as to why self-catering holiday accommodation has been lumped into phase three of the lockdown roadmap, along with hotel and other types of holiday accommodation. It is to me self-evident that self-catering accommodation, whether in caravans, holiday lodges or cottages, can be run with socially distanced family groups, providing there is deep cleaning at the time of changeovers in a way that is simply not possible in hotels, guest houses and B&Bs, which have common areas. Uh, yes, of course. Cabinet Secretary. He, he raises a genuine point. Uh, if he looks at the overall route map, uh, the underlying issue about whether self-catering, for the reasons he's just set out, could somehow, you know, could they be brought forward in advance of hotels, uh, is not about necessarily the cleaning and the distancing within the self-catering premises. It's the travelling to. And it's the travelling to and, tra and people travelling from one part of the country to another part of the country, which may have impact on the infection rate. So that's genuinely an issue. It's something we'll obviously keep close eye on. But he's right to raise it. But that's the rationale. Well, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I, I trust all my points are genuine, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, but in relation to this, I, I, welcome, I welcome the point uh, that the Cabinet Secretary has made. And the Scottish Government have, have already said, to be fair, that they would uh, be prepared to, to consider this further. And I would strongly urge them uh, uh, to do just that. 
Because for many businesses in this category, it's the lack of certainty that is their greatest concern. Because they are at present unable to take forward bookings, even for later in the year, whereas competitors elsewhere in the United Kingdom are able to do so. Now, we hear a lot about uh, people not being able to travel abroad and looking at taking staycations instead. So there is an opportunity uh, for the Scottish tourist industry, one I do not think we should lose. And I, I entirely recognise the health uh, risks attached by this, but uh, I would strongly urge the Scottish Government to look at this issue uh, very seriously and try and give some certainty and support to businesses in this vital sector. Uh, Willie Rennie, in his remarks, also talked about businesses which have fallen through the gaps in terms of the direct uh, support. And we continue to see issues with a lack of direct support for businesses by way of grants for those with a single rateable value over £51,000. Many of these businesses are middle-sized or large hotels in towns like Pitlochery, Creef or St Andrews, which are the absolute lifeblood of the local tourist economy, and yet so far have been getting no direct grant support. Now, I know the Scottish Government say they are passing on all of the Barnet consequentials from the UK Government, but they have made choices to disperse the money in different ways, as indeed they have the perfect right to do so. As Maurice Golden reminded us earlier, there are already 3.5 billion Barnet consequentials from the UK Government. And when the additional support from other funds are added together, including the furlough scheme, for example, the total UK Government support to Scotland is now in excess of 10.5 billion. In contrast, as far as I can work out, the Scottish Government appear to have allocated a mere £255 million from their own budget towards COVID-19 support. Now, Presiding Officer, I cannot believe that every penny that was set in the budget this Parliament passed back in February is accounted for and that there is no scope for reallocation. For example, we now know that the 11.40 hours free nursery care for three and four-year-olds will not be delivered in the current financial year. We know that the devolution of Social Security planned uh, for April has now been postponed. The member is really coming into his last minute. I'm giving you extra time for the intervention. Thank you. Uh, and we know that there are a whole range of, of infrastructure projects, which otherwise would be proceeding at the moment, which are likely to be delayed. And there may be other areas of spending too, where it is possible to divert resources into supporting our vital business sectors. I fear if we do not do so, and we do not take this opportunity now, we will see a greater economic impact on Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. And in the long run, we will have lower tax revenues, as I mentioned earlier. So I would urge the Scottish Government to delve deep into its budget and find the money now, if it can, to support our businesses so we have the tax revenues in the future to support the public services we all rely upon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Fraser. I call Moline Watt to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Ms Watt, Thank please. you, Presiding Officer, and welcome back. I'm pleased that we're having this debate today, which I hope and I'm sure will be the first of many as we try to take the first tentative steps on the road to economic recovery, but not at expense of health recovery. It is important to stress and stress again that reimposing lockdown is a possibility as we have seen in China and South Korea. And it is very important that the steps to re reopen businesses are tentative in line with the science and the evidence. And I'm pleased to note that the vast majority of our citizens are agree in agreement with the First Minister's cautious approach. Many in today's debate are rightly focusing in opening up the different sectors of our economy. But it is timious to air the important issues that will have to be taken into account as we rebuild our economy for the future and take the opportunity to build that an economy and that must be very different to the, one, to the one that we have, one that is built on sustainability, well-being and social justice. The opportunity was missed at the time of the banking crisis, and we have seen that the most vulnerable and younger have been hit the hardest, and inequality is grown, has grown. I do not think the younger generations will forgive us if we do not change radically this time round. We must build back better. That must be the headline of all we do as we emerge from this major health and economic shock. It is incumbent on business, finance and the state to reinvent and reimagine. It must be a job-rich economy, recognising the value of health and social care workers, of all those continuing to supply our foodstuffs and other vital goods and services. So, for example, 
If the UK government does realise that we need migrant workers to come to do this vital work and at the same time expect them to earn over 25,000, are they prepared to move more quickly to a real living wage of around £15 per hour, which is more likely to give you that £25,000 income, but also more likely to take more families out of poverty? That's the kind of joined up thinking that must take place. I managed briefly to listen to a virtual meeting of MPs, health experts, economists, and all those interested in the well-being economy, where it was said that we need the opposite of what happened after the banking crash, when wealth went into capitalist politics to an, ever, an, an even greater extent. I learned that the financial sector finances itself with 80% of its finance going back into its own sector, like finance, insurance and real estate. Businesses, as others have said, focused on sharehold maximisation rather than stakeholder maximisation. Even more than ever, it is important that we take our experiences from our constituencies during this pandemic into our role as lawmakers. This pandemic has made even more stark the inequalities in our society, with higher mortality in our poor areas and in our BAME communities. We must build back better. And it is possible. We have seen how necessity is the mother of invention. We have seen the furlough scheme rapidly introduced. We have seen help for the self-employed. We've seen how the finance secretary here has made sure she has helped as many businesses as possible in a very short space of time and th thankfully not given, in, given more to those who shout the loudest at the expense of the more vital organisations. I was very pleased to hear Rishi Sunak when he was announcing assistance to the self-employed that in future they may not enjoy the same tax breaks as previously. We know from our mailbags how many people work across our economy from legal, property and service sectors and the overuse of so-called consultancy workers, not only in the oil and gas sector, when they're not really self-employed. And I've been trying to help a constituent who rents a very small unit in one of our Aberdeen shopping centres to get a rent break, eventually to trace the owner's address to a tax haven. I'm pleased to see that Denmark is not bailing out companies using ta their tax haven status, and I hope in the future the UK will do the same. If our governments are to aid, aid, for example, our aviation sector, it must be on the basis of helping them to move a green, to a greener, more sustainable future. I thank the Scottish Government for the many discussions it has had with the oil and gas sector on how it can help this sector more, move more quickly to diversify to greener technology and keep Aberdeen in the North East as the all energy capital of Europe. And presiding officer, if vast amounts of taxpayers' money is to be used to help key sectors in our new economy, it must be the basis on the basis of taxpayers having a stake in these companies. We have seen many innovative companies reinvent and rapidly change to be sustainable going forward. We have seen others see, their business, see business op, new business opportunities that are now available and we need to help to support them going forward and business angels need to help those too. So in conclusion, presiding officer, we need more powers to make our discussions. At the same time, we also need cooperation glo globally. According to Gordon Brown this morning, there is seven trillion in tax havens worldwide. That must be harnessed to build back better. Thank you. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Tom Arthur. Ms Bailey, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Coronavirus is not just a public health crisis, it is an economic crisis. And poverty and the impact of austerity can be just as deadly a killer as COVID-19, but the effect may be less immediate. 
but already there have been job losses. At the start of the pandemic, those on zero hours, temporary and insecure contracts lost their jobs almost instantly. Whether it was hospitality or retail, or indeed lecturers at universities, these were the first economic casualties of COVID-19. Some employers went to the wall before the job furlough scheme kicked in, so people lost their jobs. And now not a day passes that there isn't a roll call of companies either downsizing or closing altogether. And it's not just small companies, important as they are, it's household names, Debenham, Shearing Holidays, Rolls-Royce, British Airways, Ovo Energy, the job losses are in their thousands, and unfortunately, there look like more to come. So I know many in the tourism industry are concerned about their survival, as it's unlikely that they will have any business this season to speak of, and most are trying to survive until March in the hope that the market picks up then. The UK government job furlough scheme has been a lifesaver, but many tourism businesses can't afford to keep staff on until March 2021, and that means the prospect of more job losses potentially before October. In Loch Lomond National Park, that could be as many as 1,200 jobs lost. That has a devastating impact on local communities, and it's not just the jobs in hotels or on cruise boats, it's the supply chain as well. So the impact in every part of our economy will be devastating. This will be a recession on a scale hitherto unseen. And I don't want a generation of young people growing up with no hope, few opportunities, and the prospect of a bleak future. So it's important we kickstart the economy for all of those reasons, but also for the finances of the country. The fiscal framework agreed by John Swinney may cause us problems. If Scotland underperforms relative to the rest of the UK, then this will have a negative effect on our block grant. If our take from income tax drops at the same rate as the rest of the UK, then the effect is neutral. But if it drops by more, then we will have the block grant reduced, and that's less money for public services, and there is reason to worry that this might happen. We have been in lockdown for longer than the rest of the UK. More companies in Scotland cease to operate than in the rest of the UK. And we have a greater reliance on industries like tourism and hospitality and oil and gas than they do in the rest of the UK. These are all reasons that should make us concerned. Now, oil and gas don't just have COVID-19 to cope with. The price of a barrel of oil has crashed. A mere six years ago, I recall a certain white paper had oil at $113 a barrel. Now, at the start of last month, it was down to $27 a barrel. And it's extraordinary. None of us could have seen, foreseen that drop. But the North Sea is now predicting the loss of 30,000 jobs on the rigs and in the supply chain too. FSB tell us that following a survey of 800 smaller firms, a third of them think they will not reopen, a quarter of them think that there will be staff redundancies. So the scale of the problem we face is huge, and so too must be the scale of our response. Let me make a few suggestions to the Cabinet Secretary. I know she likes them as well as the, the criticism, so let me make them. In the first place, let me say, in the immediate term, can I ask that the Scottish Government spend the money remaining in the business grant scheme? There are 16,000 applications pending. Let's get them dealt with. There's more than £450 million still not yet committed. Let's get that out the door. Secondly, very quickly. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I agree that we should repurpose funds that are not being spent. Uh, we have already used some of that in PERF and other funds. We want to have transparency about doing that. That would require, however, to close that scheme, which Wales is looking to do. Does she think that we should close phase one in order that we could liberate some funds that could be used elsewhere? I think Jackie we need Bailey. to deal with the 16,000 outstanding applications first to be enabled to give you confidence to be able to do that. Secondly, right, I think you need to reach sector-specific deals for tourism and for oil and gas. Thirdly, I'd like to see you bring forward capital spending to kickstart construction. Some will inevitably have to be reprofiled. Can we use that money elsewhere, such as with the Scottish National Investment Bank for grants and loans to businesses? Fourthly, do something with the supply chain. Supply chains are now shorter, they're less global. The time to encourage local supply chains is now because we know that the money is more likely to be spent locally reinvesting in the local community. Our approach, both governments' approach, needs to be about collaboration, not conflict. We cannot afford 
to have the Scottish Government or the UK Government pick fights with each other because everything else must come second to the well-being of the country and getting the economy back to work. And we need to provide hope, vision and leadership. A guarantee for young people leaving school, college or university that they have a future. The opportunity to reimagine work, more homeworking, four-day weeks, making work-life balance better. No more precarious work, no more zero-hours contracts. Let's value people for their labour and let's make sure we incorporate analysis on gender and disability into our labour market and economic policy making. I hope I don't need to say that to the Cabinet Secretary that we need a gendered approach to resolving this crisis. Before coronavirus, presiding officer, and I'll finish on this point, before coronavirus arrived, the Scottish economy was slugging, it was underperforming the rest of the UK, it's been like this for much of the last decade. The challenge now is how we do better, because we really must do better, and I'm happy to offer constructive criticism. Tom Arthur, followed by Alexander Burnett. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you, presiding officer, and welcome back. Um, I think what has probably struck all of us um, over the course of this crisis is how quickly a public health crisis has morphed into an economic crisis, which um, underlies, um, or is explained by just how connected the world has become, not over just the past century, but over per perhaps the last 20 years in particular. And I think that's left us uniquely exposed um, and it's exposed um, many businesses to hardship, it's exposed many individuals to hardship. And I think it's difficult to try and comprehend the scale of it, but I would like to just to focus in on, on two particular examples, one constituency related and one sectoral. Um, I am, um, as, as many, people, many MSPs in the west of Scotland will have been, have been contacted by constituents who are deeply concerned by developments at Rolls-Royce. Um, this is obviously their situation, um, with particular regards to the civil aviation sec uh, sector, um, it's a direct consequence of the collapse in the civil aviation um, industry and the concern, the threat of 9,000 jobs and potentially as many as 600 or 1,000 jobs at the engineering plant is of, of grave concern. Um, I have written to the Minister, uh, Jamie Hepburn, urging the government to, do, uh, to engage and to do all that they can to support employees at the site and to engage constructively with Rolls-Royce. I think it's vital that these jobs are retained, but it's not just about retaining these jobs for, for the sake of the site at Inshinnan. These are highly skilled in, in individuals and we must retain that talent, retain that skill set because that will be essential um, in meeting many of our key strategic objectives. Um, the, these are individuals who have the kind of skills that we require um, if we're going to meet our climate change obligations and if ultimately um, engagement with Rolls-Royce uh, proves to be fruitless. I think it is imperative that both the Scottish and UK governments engage with these employees to make sure that they are redeployed and repurposed and that we retain um, their enormous talent and skill. Now, another sector, a sector I wish to say a few words on is um, one that's very close to me, and that's the music sector. And I declare an interest um, at this point as a, as a member of the Musicians' Union and as someone who was previously active within music. Um, as one uh, individual within the music sector put it to me, it's an extinction level event. And I'm not talking about headline acts that come along and play at the Hydro or Murrayfield or Hamden Park. I'm talking about the count countless music, grassroots music venues and the countless musicians who operate across Scotland week in, week out. It is an incredibly um, complex ecosystem. It's also an incredibly fragile eco ecosystem. Music, grassroots music venues, for example, are not profitable, but they, in, in, in strictly financial terms, but in cultural terms, they make an enormous contribution. They are the incubators and the talent pipeline. And as things stand right now, they are facing um, ultimately uh, very little prospect of being able to recover. They will be amongst the last sectors that can re um, reopen and perhaps will not be able to return to their previous capacity and output until such times as we have a vaccine or effective treatment. So there, there must be specific sector support. We cannot lose this. Um, another area, for example, is when I was very much involved in, which is playing at weddings and corporate entertainment. Now, there might be within the public imagination the idea of a wedding band is four middle-aged male with, males with thinning hair playing music quite poorly. 
but actually the majority of people who are playing in wedding bands are highly talented, skilled, professional musicians. This provides their bread and butter. It allows them to engage in other projects, whether it's people um, who go on to go and uh, record their own material and perform across the United States, as I know, whether it's individuals that perform as session musicians with leading touring brands, whether it's professionals who go and run community choirs that so, um, greatly enrich their local communities. Without that bread and butter um, income from playing weddings and corporate events and functions, they will not be able to do these other activities. And a recent Musicians Union survey shows that up to uh, one in five musicians are now considering chucking it as a result of COVID-19. So they need specific support. And this is why it's so important that while some other sectors might be able to return to normality, it's not going to be the case for musicians, as it will not be the case for many others work operating within leisure. So there has to be, from the Scottish Government and from the UK Government, continued support until such times as we are able to return to full capacity, when these musicians can be playing at weddings and private parties and corporate functions and pubs. Because if we, if we fail to do that, we will lose something more than just a few jobs. We will lose a part of our cultural identity. And that is something, that is a casualty none of us can tolerate from, uh, as a consequence of the COVID crisis. There's, there's much that can be said, but I, I, I think for me, a key theme that's emerged from this debate is that we must not repeat the mistakes of 2008. We cannot have an austerity-led response. We have to have a level of stimulus that matches the challenge that we face. Because while a public health crisis has led to an economic crisis, there is a real and genuine danger that, that economic crisis could lead to a political and social crisis. We have existing tensions simmering under the surface across Western societies. And that touch paper could be lit by not just the experience of lockdown, but the insecurity that comes around from job loss. If we want to understand some of the events that are taking place in the United States right now, yes, it is the history of racial inequality in the United States, but much of that as well will be precipitated by the economic catastrophe facing many individuals and communities. And we cannot risk that happening in Scotland or across the UK. And if we, after a decade, it was, there was a direct link between the austerity-driven approach of two, uh, following 2008 and the Brexit vote and the rise of populism in 2016, we cannot repeat that mistake. We need a, a response in a scale not seen since following this, uh, the, the years following the Second World War. And if we do that, we I can hate to stop you in full society, flow, but I'm going to have to. climate change and create a better future Ron. for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Alexander Burnett to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Mr. Stevenson will be speaking remotely. Mr. Burnett, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I note members to my register of interest as an employer and company director. So, first of all, can I thank every person in my constituency, the North East, Scotland, and the United Kingdom, for their continued commitment to help get our country through this crisis. I have been truly heartened to see everyone in our communities come together in this difficult time and their resolve to help our governments beat this virus is working. And I have no doubt that they will continue to support efforts as we look to get the economy back up and running safely. But there are still many areas that the Scottish Government needs to do more on, many of which they were falling behind on before this virus. And I have met with many organisations and businesses over the years who have advocated the need for improved energy efficiency. And the Scottish Conservatives have been calling for this continuously. So can I use this opportunity to call on the Scottish Government to use this time in lockdown and restricted movement to help get the country back on track by focusing on the small rather than the large. Now we all know how large infrastructure projects are often the easiest route for governments to spend their way out of difficulties. And unfortunately, we all know the dismal track record this SNP government has on large infrastructure projects from bridges to hospitals. So we have a problem in Scotland so we have a problem in Scotland. Not only had the list of shovel-ready large projects dried up before this virus, but the realities of large sites being at risk of temporary shutdown due to localised outbreaks puts even more risk on these projects in terms of delivery times and subsequent cost management. So we should be... Suddenly, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Two things. The Scottish Government has got a very good record 
and, 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 and delivering big and major infrastructure projects, not least uh, the Aberdeen Peripheral uh, Road that ha could have been developed decades before, but wasn't. But he, makes, but he makes a very important point, and I agree with him, that capital infrastructure projects will be part of how we can come through it. And I also agree with him in terms of uh, reallocating that for small as well as large infrastructure projects. So I look forward to hearing what in his constituency and his region uh, he's looking forward to being developed in terms of that pipeline that delivers that green uh, renewable uh, project uh, based uh, approach that we've been talking about during this debate. Mr Burnett, I'll give you your time back. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm sure uh, history would judge the SNP on their record of large projects. Uh, but, I, but I welcome... But I welcome... I welcome... I welcome the constructive uh, approach to suggesting projects uh, and, and I'll be certainly mentioning some of the areas where I think which will help in the future. So we should be encouraging investment into small dispersed projects which will also boost our green economy. And this will happen if the Scottish Government lead by example, recognising housing as national infrastructure and kick-starts our home energy efficiency programme. And we've been calling for this for some time, to reduce carbon and boost the economy across the whole of Scotland. And we can now add to this but that it will be one of a few ways that people can safely work on infrastructure in small teams yeah. to reduce the risk of spreading the virus. Yeah. And at the construction cross-party group last week, there were discussions around how we should use this time to encourage a large-scale public sector program of maintenance. And we should grasp the opportunity for conditions inspections and remedial works in schools, colleges, museums, libraries, police stations, and on other local infrastructure like bridges, uh, that have been so woefully neglected by this SNP government. Now, this approach would not only ensure that maintenance works can continue, but will also support jobs and apprentices across the whole, scheme, the whole supply chain. And importantly, it ensures we retain our skilled workforce who are willing and ready to get back to work. And this will be as a welcome relief for 175,000 people who work directly in a sector making up 10% of Scotland's workforce. But it is not just the construction industry who can change to adapt to a new way of business. And recently I've spoken with BP, Oil and Gas UK, as well as the OGA, discussing issues around their targets towards achieving net zero. And there are some innovative projects out there, from the electrification of platforms to hydrogen production and carbon capture. So I would like to applaud all our oil and gas workers throughout the whole supply chain for their hard work and resilience to tough times, and always their ability to innovate and adapt. Now, as the MSP for Aberdeenshire West, can I end with a call for our rural economy, another sector that has been on the cusp of great opportunity for too long under the Scottish Government. For too long, we've heard the benefits of rural life, how Scotland's tourism and food and drink sectors are a way forward, which I agree with. All, sadly, given more spin than support over the last decade as infrastructure crumbles and relative, relative connectivity worsens. And it will come as no surprise to any rural MSP to hear how the issues of broadband became even more chronic during lockdown. And the future looks no better as the R100 project continues to be delayed. So if ever there was a chance to jumpstart the rural economy, to jumpstart it for the benefit of the whole of Scotland, then it is now. So I ask the Scottish Government, will you please invest more wisely? Will you prioritise the issues that matter to people most? You have an opportunity to start a fresh page. Please don't just cut and paste your previous mistakes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Stuart Stevenson. Mr Stevenson is the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, presiding officer, uh, welcome back. I'd like to join you soon. Um, let me just start with one single word to, to anyone on the Conservative benches about projects. HS2. Now, presiding officer, the next uh, steps required to rebuild their economy after the shutdown caused by the pandemic cannot all be known. Indeed, some of uh, what will turn out to be the most important steps may only be identifiable some years after they were taken. The immediate concern of government is to minimise harm to existing businesses. That's proper. Mr Stevenson, will you pause just a moment? Pause just a moment. The sound is quite quiet from you, so if we could have that up a bit. And also, can I say to members, I can't hear Mr Stevenson if you mumble. You'll appreciate it's difficult when somebody's speaking remotely. Thank you, Mr Stevenson. 
uh, the immediate concern of government is to minimise harm to existing businesses. Uh, that's proper because those businesses already established will be the source of employment for the overwhelming majority of those who will be in work in six months, a year, a couple of years. Um, but I want to concentrate on where the real building of a new economy will take place. It will start, as almost all new businesses do, with small business. Uh, ten years ago, BrewDog were a small brewery in my constituency with a handful of employees. Today, they're an international company worth in excess of a billion pounds. So what helped them get there? New ideas, new money, risk-taking and risk-managing owners coupled with very good marketing. But even with all that, the outcome, certainly not the scale of the outcome, was very far from predictable. The new businesses that will be the new brew dogs in 10 years' time simply can't be known today. So it's about removing barriers and being prepared as a public realm to be brave. Adversity creates difficulty, but it also spurs innovation. On the 27th of April 2007, a dispute over the moving of a Soviet-era memorial in Tallinn was the trigger for an electronic attack on every public institution in Estonia. That's a country of 1.3 million residents. Today, Estonia has a hardened electronic infrastructure and is a leader in converting their country into a robust online commerce. One may become an e-resident of Estonia for a modest sum, currently 120 euros. They've created an infrastructure for people around the world to establish companies, open and operate bank accounts. They've created secure and trusted electronic uh, identities for their e-residents. A large cohort of foreign companies are now resident there. Without Estonia becoming a tax haven, their attraction as a place of residence is much more than that. There are plenty of other opportunities that we might look to. Yes, government, let's crank up support for our micro businesses, small businesses, even our medium businesses. The next winner might be in there. Now, some specifics, and they're a bit off the wall deliberately to provoke thinking uh, of what we might uh, be doing. Let's direct uh, our help to new ideas or reinventions of old ones in the expectation that in doing that, 80% of our interventions will fail. If we get it right, the 20% will far more than pay for the failure of the 80%. Now, don't analyse projects to death. If we could spot the winning projects, if I could, I'd be a very rich man indeed. Look instead at the people who are trying to take something forward. Uh, there are those who have the knowledge, energy and self-belief that will take them somewhere useful for themselves and useful uh, for our country. Back then, ignore their proposals. Don't pretend we can spot winners. Now back small team. It's amazing what one man can do leading a team of 12. They can even exceed when one of them is a duffer or even a Judas. You can spot the failing ones very quickly in small team. You need no management structure to make a small team work. We had uh, Europe's main center for medical training in Edinburgh hundreds of years ago. Why? Because the old town was desperately insanitary and at correspondingly high degrees of morbidity. It's an excellent place to study disease. What could we be doing today in the COVID world? Are there genetic differences that drive different outcomes? We know that's the case for many other conditions. This is a virus about which we're still learning, but we've no equivalent broad spectrum attacker on viruses in general as antibiotics were once against bacteria. Scotland has a particular advantage in that the data that are present in our national birth, marriage and death records is more comprehensive than almost anywhere else. It's thus easier to identify connections of paternity, maternity and consanguinity than in many countries. Could we use that? That's worth trying. In 1973, I fell out with my boss about a software development. 
I spent the weekend in the computer center pursuing my idea, showed him on Monday. I met someone a couple of years ago who was still maintaining that same software I developed 45 years ago. We may need a few more angry youngsters. Let's find them, let's support them, and I'm not volunteering, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. I move to closing speeches. Rhoda Grant for Labour, please. Uh, six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer, and welcome back to the big chair. Uh, Scotland's economy has been fragile for a long time before the pandemic took effect, and we in the Scottish Labour Party were continuously calling for an industrial strategy to help grow the economy in a way that works for the many and not just the few. And had the government paid heed, we would not have been in such a place going into this pandemic. Scottish Government's State of the Economy report highlighted that Scotland's economic output could decline by as much as 33% simply in the period of social distancing. So it's clear that to reduce the devastating impact of COVID-19, we need a targeted industrial strategy to help save jobs and retain skills. As we start thinking about the return to work, we all need to be reassured that the right health and safety measures are in place and are enforceable. And to do this, we need a health and safety executive that's fit for purpose, that cooperates closely with local government, with government agencies and local government, because much of the policing of workplaces um, during the pandemic has fallen to environmental health officers and they need to be resourced. And critically, we need strong and continued trade union involvement to ensure that those returning to work are safe. Trade union health and safety representatives can work with employers and cut out much of the anxiety. They're well trained and unions will be supporting them in their role to ensure that workplaces are safe. So this is not only saving employers money, but it also gives workers the confidence they need to return back to the workplace. Now, we know that many sectors are going to be very negatively impacted by the effects of COVID-19. And Richard Leonard talked about the FSB, who said they thought that a third of their, the, the companies they represent would not reopen. That's a huge amount of businesses. We also know that tourism is really badly affected and Jackie Bailey in her speech talked about maybe March next year for a reopening of some of the tourism sector. We know that culture and hospitality are also hugely affected because they require people to gather together and with them so are the businesses that depend on them, their workers and their supply chains. Daniel Johnston intervened and talked about charities and the need to support them. A lot of the burden of response to the COVID-19 pandemic has fallen at the door of charities, but they cannot fundraise because of social distancing. And in rural areas, we know that people work three and four different jobs just to make ends meet. And I welcome the announcement on bed and breakfast because I think that will make a big difference in the rural economy. Community Land Scotland, um, in their briefing for the debate today, talked about resilient communities, and this is very true, we're hearing about this in rural areas, but they need access to the economic levers, and that is ownership of land to make a difference, because the alternative for these rural areas is depopulation at an even greater pace than we already have. Again, all of our communities are dependent on oil and gas, as Jackie Bailey said, and every sector needs a tailored response because their experience is different. We also know that different people are affected more badly than others. And we've talked about young people, we know about women, and we know about the, the low paid. And those are the groups that are going to be really badly affected. Richard Leonard, in his presentation, asked for a jobs guarantee scheme, a Scottish government funded job guarantee that could bring together trade unions, businesses, local government, and indeed uh, all parts of Scotland. Um, we could look at apprenticeships for young people, carrying on in education, um, and value the work that women do. do. 
because I remember back in the 80s, the community project where a lot of work was carried out for a living wage that benefited the environment. And I think we need to look at that again, but we must ensure an end to the gig economy that failed everybody. We should also make sure that assistance goes to companies that practice fair work. They should, it should only be given to companies who look after their employees and not companies who offshore to avoid paying their tax um, on profits made in the UK. And I welcome that the Scottish Government have signed up to these principles. But can I then ask that they now implement those very principles for procurement in the post-COVID economy? Maureen Watt talked about Gordon Brown talking about the trillions of money that, of, of pounds that are held in tax havens. We could use that. And the Scottish Government could bring forward capital spending, as was suggested by Jackie Bailey, but if they brought it forward with those fair work principles and also asking those that were carrying out that work to sign up to the fair tax mark, we could actually make sure that the spending that we have in Scotland is kept in Scotland and works to the, the benefit of our economy. Presiding officer, out of this tragedy, some good must come. We can't go back to the same economic answers where wealth is amassed by the few. We have to create an economy that works for all. And those that were undervalued who work for poverty wages are the very people who are shouldering the brunt of the responsibility in fighting COVID-19. The post-COVID world must be different and there is an opportunity to create a fair economy and we need to start building that now. Thank you very much. And I call Donald Cameron to close to the Conservative. Seven minutes, please, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And like others, it's very good to see you in person. Um, as we continue to uh, gradually ease out of lockdown and back to a semblance of normality, it's clear that we have seen seismic interventions from both uh, of Scotland's governments to deal with the impacts of this deadly virus that are quite simply unprecedented at this scale. And Jackie Bailey was right to say that we must have a constructive approach, uh, as we've seen so far by both the Scottish Government and the UK Government. The UK government has injected an estimated £10 billion into Scotland to support our workers, to prevent massive job losses and to support the efforts of our NHS. And we've seen the creation of a series of schemes at both UK and Scottish level, which has ensured that thousands of businesses have not gone to the wall. We've seen the enactment of furloughing the job retention scheme, which has paid the wages of hundreds of thousands of workers in Scotland and will hopefully mean they will have a job to return to when this is over. We estimate that such workers have benefited to the tune of over £4.8 billion of that particular support. And then there's the self-employed. Now, as someone who spent 11 years of their life as a self-employed uh, advocate, I know the insecurities of this status, of the gnawing doubts that when you're not working, you're not earning, of being afraid to turn down work just in case it's the last job for a while. So I'm particularly pleased to acknowledge the self-employed uh, support scheme extended only last week, which has delivered support to hard-working self-employed people. And then the additional 3.5 billion in Barnet consequentials. I was pleased to see the Scottish Government acknowledge that last week in their summer budget revision. Again, supporting Scottish businesses and our vital public services through this time of crisis. And we should acknowledge what the UK Government has done to ensure we can protect people during this crisis. And likewise, it would be churlish not to acknowledge and welcome what the Scottish Government has done and how they too have stepped up to the plate in many ways to support the economy and people's jobs. And in principle, the route map and the phased approach to easing lockdown makes eminent sense. But we should also acknowledge there have been failings. Every MSP here will have organisations or, or individuals approaching us to tell them of gaps in support offered by the Scottish Government. Willie Rennie was one person who spoke of this this afternoon. Whether that is ensuring businesses can access similar support to that which they receive south of the border or helping those businesses who could not access any support whatsoever. And we can't ignore the fact that political decisions taken in the health sphere impact on the economy. Thus, failures to ramp up testing, for example, will also have a significant effect on ensuring when we can restart our economy and hopefully we can restart it sooner 
rather than later. And as others have done, it's important to give a broad overview of the economic picture from the point of the view of those who represent business, such as the FSB, and who want to see us reopen our economy. And as Morris Gold and Richard Leonard and Jackie Bailey uh, have quoted, the FSB have uh, somewhat pessimistically said that a third of their members fear they may be closed permanently as a result of the crisis. They've also said that one in five business owners reported that they've sold assets or struggled to make commercial mortgage or rent payments. And they've also said that over the next three months, a quarter of firms are considering making some staff redundant. That is all of deep concern uh, of whatever political stripe we belong to. And a reason why we need to continue to promote reopening the economy as safely but as swiftly as practicable. And as uh, I think Maurice Golden quoted, the uh, Scottish Retail Consortium director, David Lonsdale, wrote that food rate, non food retailers are losing £130 million a week. And he said that it's unclear why ministers, for example, have put larger stores to the back of the queue when it comes to phased reopening. And they believe, and I have great sympathy with their view, that the focus should be on whether or not the business can reopen safely as opposed to its size. Of course. The answer to that is very similar to the answer I gave to Merger Fraser. It's not necessarily the uh, safety that can be exercised within the workplace. It's also the position of the workers travelling to the workplace and indeed the uh, shoppers travelling to, for example, out of town, large retail um, uh, outlets uh, uh, undercover. And, and that's the issue. That's the safety issue uh, that has to be seen in the round. Donald Cameron. I, I accept that, but I would um, urge the Cabinet Secretary to um, take on these concerns because there is a belief that these businesses, there are many businesses that can reopen safely and operate safely regardless of their size. And he went on to note that the Scottish Government's route map is also thin on timescales for moving between the different phases, making it tricky for firms to plan ahead uh, with confidence. And I recognise that there is a deliberate lack of set dates within the government's plan, given that the various phases are subject to progress we make in combating the virus. But it is also clear that retailers, for one, need clarity. And it's not just uncertainty over timing, which is uh, in, uh, creating issues for our business as we move out of lockdown. There is confusion about other issues too. And uh, many members have spoken about tourism and the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy will know that last week I raised the issue of hotels closing uh, in the Highlands and Islands. Um, because many businesses uh, suffered uh, in terms of uh, uncertainty about grants during lockdown, but the same businesses now want to know when they can reopen and how they can do so safely with the financial security of being able to get through some tough months ahead. And uh, as Murdo Fraser mentioned, the self-catering industry, for example, has made very strong representations to begin to reopen safely at phase two uh, as opposed to phase two, to, to phase three. Uh, and Murdo Fraser also said this. Um, he said that decisions about exiting lockdown are political decisions. They're choices made by the Scottish Government, as they're entitled to do, but they're nobody else's. And the Scottish Government must, in my view, be responsible for those decisions, because businesses may be faced with losing vital support earlier and will want to know whether the Government can provide financial support. Um, uh, he also said that, um, and I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary of Finance can address this in her, in her remarks uh, following, whether the Scottish Government, given that it has abandoned certain policy initiatives, has looked at further reallocating funds within its own budget. Because this is not just a matter of Barnet consequentials, it's a matter of the Scottish Government's budget too. Um, Briefly, I was struck by the comments made by... I, I'm the sorry, members I, in his I last minute, you should be time. concluding shortly. Um, uh, I meant comments by Kenny Gibson about the islands, great sympathy with what he said. Um, Alex Burnett on the importance of broadband. If there's one thing this crisis has shown, then it's uh, a, 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 re, a um, reconsideration of how important that is. And Stuart Stevenson on the importance of micro and small businesses. So, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, um, businesses require certainty and clarity. Our economy is in a fragile place, confidence is dented. People will no doubt remain worried about their own jobs and it is right that we all play our part to support them. But it is also right that the Scottish Government takes responsibility for its actions and its choices during this crisis, listens to voices of business and workers to restart and rebuild our economy 
and works tirelessly to ensure that Scotland recovers as quickly and as safely as possible. Thank you. I call on Kate Forbes to close the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, please, nine minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'll start with a, an area of consensus, which is that the health crisis has led to an economic crisis. And can I say very clearly at the outset that we know the harm being done to the economy. We know the enormous pressures on businesses and we know the stress and the worry facing workers and employers over the last few weeks. Those worries have been unimaginable. And as Jackie Bailey says, the impact has been widespread and it's been deep. Tom Arthur articulated the impact on certain sectors, in particular the music industry, which has felt catastrophic at times. And as others have said, there is also an age and a gender dimension to the impact of the economic crisis, which we need to take seriously. And so our initial response to those challenges in collaboration with the UK government was to respond quickly with a financial package of support, reducing fixed costs through 100% rates relief, helping with cash flow through grants and protecting the productive capacity of the economy with key financial interventions and in anchor businesses through the Pivotal Resilience Fund. We took those actions precisely because of just, the importance... Just a few minute, Cabinet Secretary. Because you're sitting so far apart, I can hear your conversation, Mr Torrance. I'm sure you're not directing it at me. Cabinet Secretary. We took those actions precisely because of the importance we place on the many small and medium-sized businesses in every town, every city and every region of Scotland. Presiding officer, beyond the initial financial interventions which I've mentioned, we've also listened at every step of the way to other parties and to businesses, never being too scared or too entrenched to make changes, to establish new schemes and to accept recommendations. None of this has been easy. Designing financial schemes at pace without access to the tax system like HMRC and reaching some of the smallest businesses has tested all of our systems. Local authority staff, enterprise agencies and representative organisations like the FSB and the Chambers of Commerce have all risen to the challenge to deliver for businesses in every corner of Scotland. And it was good to hear Willie Rennie paying credit to those organisations. Presiding officer, whilst the pandemic is far from over, our minds are turning to recovery. Now, can I make a brief comment about the budget? Because Murdo Fraser and Donald Cameron both referenced the need to find more funding to support businesses. And of course, the summer budget revision, which was laid last week, captures the impact of COVID on the budget. Uh, Murdo Fraser mentioned ELC funding, for example, and local authorities have full flexibility over that funding now, both revenue and capital, to use it for other means. Many members have talked about capital projects that might not be able to go ahead in creating some uh, spare capital. And of course, right now, it isn't capital that businesses need, it's revenue. But we will use that capital to invest in projects, as Fiona Hislop said. And some have called on us to find money from elsewhere in the budget. Now, I would just remind the Chamber that the UK government funding for the furlough scheme, for the self-employed scheme, for the grants, is borrowed. The OBR assume that the Chancellor will need to borrow nearly £300 billion. This government cannot borrow revenue for coronavirus, and neither do we want to see revenue cuts in areas that are critical to our recovery. So we are fully committed to rejecting austerity, to investing in our economy and to move forward together. But one of the challenges identified by the IFS, the Fiscal Commission and many others is how our fiscal powers right now restrict our ability to manage that uncertainty going forward. Now, our relationship with the UK government, and I don't often say this, is constructive. Donald Cameron and Jackie Bailey both called for that constructive relationship and the investments, the consequential funding that has been given is critically important, but consequentials are funding, or sorry, are estimates. That is just a, a fact. They can be revised down as a recent announcement about 60 million pounds was. And so all we are asking for are the flexibilities, the minor powers and the funding guarantees in order to invest in recovery, in order to reject austerity and in order to ensure that there is sufficient funding for our communities and for our businesses. And I hope that that is something that all parties in this chamber come back. And I think I heard Jackie Bailey at least indicating some form 
of support there for a review of the fiscal framework? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, yes. <laughs> It's a, a senior moment. I'm sorry, Mr. Whiteman. You see what happens when you're away for 12 weeks. Mr. Whiteman. Well, well, welcome back. Welcome back, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Minister for taking intervention. Uh, does she agree with me that there might be some mileage in exploring with the UK Government the extent to which, rather than the £200 million of uh, magic money tree money that's being uh, created by the Bank of England, obviously being spent by the UK Government, partly in Scotland, uh, that uh, a population share of that might better be allocated the Scottish administration to spend as it sees fit, or uh, am I uh, um, barking up the wrong tree there? My apologies, Mr. White. It was all going too well till then. Cabinet Secretary. We are keen to explore all options right now in terms of how we invest, and working with the UK government to look at a further consequential funding, which we can then use and adapt to the specific needs in the Scottish economy and in Scottish society, as well as the powers to manage the uncertainty. So the short answer is yes to the question that Andy Whiteman asked. Presiding officer, looking ahead, in the next few weeks and the next few months, we'll face choices. Choices that, if made wisely, will change our economy and our society for the better and members have all raised uh, suggestions and recommendations whether that's to unlock the innovation that, that Willie Rennie called for or to back the startups that Kenny Gibson mentioned to make work and living less fragile as Andy Whiteman said to make significant progress on some of the structural inequalities that Richard Leonard identified and to move to a greener more sustainable and fairer future as Maureen Watt said to learn from the mistakes of the response in 2008 and do things better as Tom Arthur argued and all of those I would assume are backed across the chamber they are worthy goals but we need to do things differently I think my time is running out and I've not got I've not got much time we also want to back our entrepreneurs so that they are the success stories on an international basis in the next 10 years as Stuart Stevenson said so we have choices to make and we will rise to that challenge as we have risen to the challenge of this economic crisis uh, brought on by the health crisis of coronavirus as we look ahead over the next few weeks, we want to see businesses open and trading as safely as possible. And as some have said, businesses want certainty about when to open. But I would argue that equally they want to know how to operate safely. And for tourism, it will not be enough to reopen. We also need to see markets return. And the route map that was published is designed to give a sense of the direction of travel to give some of that certainty, but it needs to be backed up with detailed guidance published in advance of certain sectors reopening. And as members will know, there are about 14 working groups just now representing different sectors to build that guidance, uh, informed heavily by representatives from those sectors. So there have been many good recommendations to how we support different sectors, how we use capital to invest with an economic stimulus and how we ensure that every penny is invested in businesses that have been hard hit. There has been a great amount of work done in the last few months to respond to the crisis and that will continue. We want to do as much as possible to keep people safe and to protect livelihoods. But the next stage of restarting the economy will require us to take action now that will have an immediate effect, yes, but will also have an impact far further down the line. We want to set the direction for the recovery of the economy and for the future. We want to be making decisions now that in 10 years time, we can look back and see that decisions made now made the difference to future generations. We'll only succeed in that by taking a collaborative approach and working together across this chamber and across our nation. Thank you very much. And that concludes the debate on COVID-19 Next Steps Economy. And it's time to move on to the next item of business. But before I do, can I remind members that social distancing measures are in place and ask that you please observe these, including when exiting the chamber. And as there are no questions we put as a result of today's business, I, I close this meeting. Point of order.
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and apologies for not giving you prior notice of this point of order. However, earlier on today, in response to a question from Jackie Bailey, the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, made a statement about regarding the science of asymptomatic transmission of the coronavirus. She quoted a WHO situation report that was published on the 2nd of April, uh, quoting, there has been no documented asymptomatic transmission. What she failed to do was say what the following sentences stated. The next sentence said that this does not exclude the possibility that this may occur. And the sentence after that confirms that asymptomatic cases have been reported as part of contact tracing efforts in some countries. By only quoting the first sentence, I believe that Parliament may be given the false impression that the WHO was denying the risk of asymptomatic transmission, whereas the contrary is true. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will want to correct well, the record. Um, I've been a little lax with you because that, of course, was not a point of order, and that's the only time I'm going to do that. Uh, it's now on the record, and it's a matter for the Cabinet Secretary to look at afterwards. I obviously wasn't here for any of that to be. I closed this meeting for the second time.